from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you so much for attending our literacy conference today here on reading promotion and the battle to keep people reading. Um, it's great to see all you. Thanks to our participants as well as our attendees. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce to you the new director of the Center for the Book, John Van Udenaren. Thank you, Guy. Uh, welcome to all of you here. Uh, I'm new, as you know, to the Center for the Book, uh, so I'm going to be learning from all of you. Uh, I follow in the illustrious foot footsteps of John Cole, who I believe is here. Uh, and uh, and I've benefited from the help of Becky Clark, who's, who's been enormously helpful in this transition period, and of course, Guy, who will, who is, who has, uh, who has organized this event. I like the title, I don't know who came up with that, but um, Reading Promotion and the Battle to Keep People Reading. Those of us who worked a lot with Dr. Billington over the years, uh, no, uh, he, he always talked about battle plans. I don't know whether, I haven't worked enough with Dr. Hayden to know whether she uses that phrase, but Dr. Billington was always saying, we need a battle plan for this and a battle plan for that. So if, if it's a battle to keep people reading, uh, one of the things I would think would be possibly emerging from this meeting would be uh, something like a battle plan, or at least elements that would go into a battle plan. So, um, it, it, it should be a very interesting day. Uh, this conference is an outgrowth of the Library of Congress Literacy Awards, uh, which um, are now in their sixth year. And the Literacy Awards are made possible by the gener generous uh, giving of uh, David Rubenstein, who's one of the leading patrons uh, of the Library of Congress. Uh, so we want to acknowledge his help, even though he's not here this morning. And we also want to give special thanks to the advisory board of the Liter Literacy Awards. Uh, they will be meeting tomorrow, but I think most of the members are, are, are here uh, this morning as well and will be participating today. I also want to say a few words to uh, uh, introduce Dawn Stitzel. Dawn Stitzel is the, is the uh, new program manager uh, for the Literacy Awards. Uh, and uh, I think a lot of you have already had some email contact with her, especially the members of the advisory board. Uh, but maybe if Dawn is around, maybe she can say a few words. Thank you, John. And it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I've been recently given the responsibility of um, overseeing the Literacy Awards program for the Center for the Book and the Library of Congress. I've been on the job about five weeks, and so, um, so today I'm actually here as a guest. Um, today's event was, was planned by uh, Guy and other folks at the Center for the Book, and I'm just sort of soaking it in and um, look forward to speaking with you throughout the day to kind of think of ways that we can amplify the impact of the Literacy Awards program moving forward, and I'm just so grateful for all the help I've received from the advisory board members who have, I've had a great deal of contact with already, and also um, a special call out to, <clears throat> excuse me, Becky Clark, um, who's been fantastic in helping in the transition of uh, conveying the information over. So again, yeah, reach out to me. Uh, please reach out to me if I don't have a chance to speak with you. Um, again, I really want to talk about ways and, and get ideas for for our moving forward. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Dawn. Well, I think with that, we can uh, probably get started, turn it over to Guy, who will be our MC for, for this morning and who will uh, do whatever additional uh, thank yous are, are necessary and called for uh, with regard to all the people who've made this happen. <laughs> 
Thanks, John. Okay, we're going to get started. Um, we have a first panel today, which is going to be moderated by Leslie Farmer of the Library of Congress Literacy Awards Advisory Board. She's also a professor, College of Education at California State University, Standing Committee on Literacy, and the International Federation of Library Associations. Please welcome Leslie Farmer, who will introduce you to the rest of the panelists. So I'd like the panelists to come on up now. Thank you uh, for being here, for helping to spread the word about literacy, and not only that, but take really important action and efforts to make sure that everyone has the opportunity to read and um, be able then to improve all of our societies. So I'll have each of our um, distinguished folks introduce themselves. There we go. So we'll start with Lois Bridges. So just a couple of words about why you're here. <clears throat> well, it's a tremendous honor to be here. Hi, everyone. I'm Lois Bridges, and I'm the VP publisher of Scholastic Professional. And I have the deep honor of serving on the Literacy Awards Board. Bonjour, Anine. Hello, I'm Lorreen Roy. I'm a professor at the School of Information, University of Texas at Austin. I'm Anishinaabe, enrolled on the White Earth Reservation, a member of the Minnesota Chippewa Tribe, and I'm also on the advisory board. I'm Steve Krashen, and I'm kind of depressed. <laughs> Yesterday on the Metro, a young lady offered me her chair, her seat. <laughs> I'll get over this. Uh, anyway, um, I want to explain one of the things that's on my bio. It says I have a black belt in Taekwondo. It's true, but I got it on the basis of the written examination. <laughs> so much for literacy. Yesterday at Union Station, a young man hit me up for a dollar. That was OK. And we had a conversation. He said the best, he, I did not tell him what I did. I didn't tell him while I was here, nothing. The best thing that happened to him in prison, the prison library. Oh. Howard, he said, have you ever heard of Howard Zinn? Oh. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? We're doing good work. Let's keep it up. Okay. So I suppose if we're going to battle with words, uh, we've got a Tai Chi uh, expert right here. So. <laughs> so I really want to take advantage of this uh, brief time and understand we are not going to be doing the full Howard's Inn, or equivalent of the, a nation of readers, but at least we want to just uh, start opening the windows, the doors, in terms of some of the issues because that's something that we should be talking about all our lives. So uh, first we kind of like to get the idea of like what are some of the facts out there and fortunately you also have a, a wonderful publication by Scholastic that gives you, you know, some of the, the background information. So Lois is going to just start us out with uh, getting the framework. Okay. Well, um, on your table, as Leslie said, you should see the sixth edition of the Scholastic Kid and Family Reading Report. This comes out every other year. And I'm just going to highlight a few of the key findings for you. Um, let's see. Oh, this will automatically go. I just want to mention that it, um, for the uh, sixth edition, we surveyed 2,700 uh, families and kids. It is a nationally representative sample, and the people that we interviewed didn't know that we uh, were with Scholastic. Um, and the idea behind this report really is to um, uh, try to understand the attitudes and uh, behaviors of families as they connect with reading. So, um, the first thing I want to mention is the critical importance of choice. It turns out that choice, the, the books that you choose to read, reflect your agency and identity as a reader. And I think that all makes sense to us. Those of us with rich reading lives have a clear sense of the kinds of books that we like to read, the authors that we love, the genres we like. And that's a big part of discovering yourself as a reader as a young child. So we were happy to see that when it comes to reading for fun, 63% uh, 
um, of kids say they get to choose their books for fun. Let me turn to my... Uh, and in response to the statement, whoops, get lined up with a... Um, I am more likely to finish reading a book that I've picked out myself. 88% say yes. If I get to choose the book myself, I'm more interested in it, and I'm going to finish reading it. Okay, just a quick word about the disparity of books in the home, and Stephen will likely have different statistics. It'll be interesting. Um, Scholastic found that the average number of books in the home were 104. But there are almost twice as many books in the homes of frequent readers versus infrequent readers. And by frequent readers, I mean kids who are reading every single day, five to seven days a week. Moderate readers, one to four days a week. And infrequent read readers, less than a day a week. So you can see that. Um, Oh, and, and one thing I wanted to mention is how do the <coughs> books get in the home to begin with? And the number one reason is because kids ask for the books. So you can see that if you're a frequent reader, if you have a sense of yourself as a reader, you know what books to ask your parents for. But, and this of course is, Stephen will have lots of information about this, if you have the means to purchase the books or you have access to a public library that's open, it's easier for you to bring those books into your home. So, then, um, <clears throat> sorry, got lined up. Um, reading frequency is largely steady. There's a slight drop in frequent readers from 2010 to 2016. That's good news we hear so much about how kids no longer like to read, and that's not what we found at all. Um, in 2010, maybe 37% of kids thought that reading for fun was very important. It did drop slightly to 32%, but for the most part, kids are reading and enjoy reading. Um, what about uh, kids' views on the importance of reading? Again, it's holding steady. In fact, it even went up a bit. In 2010, only 50% thought it was important. In 2016, that went up to 55%. So that's good. And <clears throat> I will say that we are keeping our eye on younger teens because we did notice that um, in terms of their interest in reading books for fun, there has been a drop. In 2010, 61% enjoyed reading books for fun. That dropped to 50% in 2016. So we're going to keep our eye. We're actually in the process right now putting together another report. And that's a group we really want to check in with. OK, now this is something interesting. 57% um, of kids aged 6 to 17 who are infrequent readers say it's hard for them to find books they like to read. And that makes sense. If you don't read, you don't necessarily, you haven't necessarily established an identity as a reader. And so you're, you know, it's hard for you to find books that you like to read. And I'm reminded of a, a quote I like a lot from James Patterson. You may recognize him as, actually, I think he is the number one uh, he has more books on the New York Times bestseller list than any other author ever. And he said that there's no such thing as a kid who hates reading. There are kids who love to read, and there are kids who just haven't found the right book yet. And so it's our responsibility to help kids find the right books. And one quick little story. Annie Ward, assistant superintendent of the Marinette School District, which is just north of, of New York City, is doing something so fabulous, I just have to tell real quickly. How many of you are familiar with Stitch Fix? Has, any, has anyone in here heard that? You fill out a profile of the kinds of clothes you like to read, and then they put together a custom box for you. Well, in Mamaroneck District, the kids are filling out 
list of the kinds of books they like to read, and uh, working with the librarian, volunteers are putting together custom, I could almost cry, custom book boxes that show up at the kid's house. Can you imagine how amazing that is? So those kids are going to begin to regard themselves as readers. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah, so, but this is interesting. Parents, even though kids know that it's hard for them to find books, parents haven't quite caught up with that. 41% um, of all kids said it is hard to find books to read. Only 29% of parents seem to realize that. So that's something we need to pay more attention to. And then just quick update on reading aloud, because that's really how it all begins, right? Really good news about reading aloud. Um, five quick points. First of all, more parents are beginning to read to kids from the moment of birth. So that's gone up in just since 2014 from 30% of parents who are doing that, now 40% are. Also, they're reading every day of the week, not just once in a while, but every day of the week. And they're reading more books, not just one book, but multiple copies. Now, we do find that as kids get older, usually age five or age eight, parents, you know, the kids are reading themselves, so parents think they don't need to read to them anymore. So it, it tends to diminish. <clears throat> but the good news is that it's going on. Oh, and, and choice, since we talked about choice, Right from the very beginning, little guys are getting to choose their own books. So that's good. And the word on reading aloud, why do people like to do it? Because it is an absolutely exquisite way to spend time with your child. And it's just such great fun to share books that you love. And then one last slide on the summer slide, and I'm sure Stephen has information about that. But um, we found <clears throat> that on average, kids were reading about eight books a year. I mean, eight books over the summer, excuse me. But it really depends on your means. So kids from families where they have less may not be reading books at all over the summer. 21%, no books at all. If you come from a family of means, then only 8% are not reading books. So income level makes a huge difference. And I just can't resist sharing one beautiful quote from a parent in Texas. She says, you're never alone if you have a good book. A good story, fiction or nonfiction, can open up the imagination for problem solving and critical thinking, or just for working through the tough spots in life. A truly good story sucks you in and opens up a whole new world. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah. So know that there's also some great research that uh, Dr. Krashen has himself you know, conducted as well as synthesized. And if you didn't have a chance to get his three-page synthesis uh, at the break, you can, can do that. Uh, so there's a lot of facts out there, and now we want to tell the story of why we have these particular reading habits and how we can improve that situation. And it can be as simple as students, not, you know, young people not even understanding the term reading. If they think that reading means just you know, the textbook and a basal one, you can see why you know, some students may say, I don't like to read or I'm not a reader, where you know, they haven't... Um, really been told that folks, hey, reading's everywhere. It's your billboards. It's your menu. It's your game instructions. So just reconceptualizing reading is a really good start. But again, um, Dr. Krashen has lots of info. So what we're going to be doing is doing kind of a whip between him and Dr. Roy in terms of what's, what's one factor in this uh, situation and how do we address it? So, Dr. Krashen, you can start. Okay. <clears throat> uh, Michael and Greg, could you guys do me a favor? Thanks. One per customer, three sheets, pass it around right there. Thank you. I think I'll Earn your salary. Okay. Good. 
Okay, good. Um, we're supposed to talk about one thing. I have a formula. And the formula is on the top of the handout, which you don't have a copy of. The big deal is poverty, poverty, poverty. <clears throat> Martin Luther King. We're likely to find that the problems of housing and education, instead of preceding the elimination of poverty, will themselves be affected if poverty is first abolished. Everything that has happened since Dr. King said this in 1967, every last bit of research supports this from many, many different directions. Poverty means less access to books. Less access to books means not much reading is happening. The more reading you do, the more literate you get. This is my formula. Thank you very much. I'll see you next. Oh, let me give you the rest. <clears throat> let me do the first part. Uh, poverty means less access to books. People living in poverty, as Lois has uh, reported from the last data, have far less access to books. The first chart on is one that Lois already showed you from the Scholastic Report from 1960. Children who live in high poverty homes simply have a lot fewer books in the home. Not just in the home, in the community, in the library. Great paper, Luminous Smile, published a piece of the reading research quarterly in 2001. I love it when these great reports come out in the snob journals, because that's what this one is. Most of the articles in this journal are completely incomprehensible. So that makes it a great paper usually. And there's this fabulous thing. Look at libraries, <coughs> access to books in two rich communities, middle class communities two poor communities in Philadelphia. Poor children had practically no access to books anywhere. Good section on libraries. Public libraries in the middle income schools were open more evenings, stayed open longer, far more juvenile books. Wonderful quote from Newman and Solano, which you don't have, I'll read aloud. Children in middle income neighborhoods were likely to be deluged with books. However, children from poor neighborhoods would have to aggressively and persistently seek them out. I'm just giving you a few examples from a vast literature. The more access to books, contrary to popular opinion, the more children read. Oh, let's not give, give them books, they won't read them anyway. Well, you've seen what happens when the new box of books comes to the fourth grade class. The children rush to see what's there. The research confirms this. <clears throat> Summer reading. Children who live closer to libraries do more reading over the summer. I got the date wrong on this. On your sheet it says 1985. It's 1975 and it's the heroic Barbara Haynes who did the first study of the summer slump and is one of the absolute best studies. Our study, my uh, former student Francisco Ramos, this is our second best known paper. Our first best known paper, which I'm sure you've read, is called Arnold's Advantages how Arnold Schwarzenegger acquired English and what he said he did, which were two different things. Okay, enough gossip. Who was it who said, if you don't have anything good to say about someone, sit next to me? That was Alice Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt's daughter. Anyway, uh, Francisco taught in a school, uh, an elementary school, where there were high poverty, very few books, but there was a public library close by. He organized a group of second and third grade teachers, including himself, and they made one trip to the library before the library opened. The librarians were very cooperative. Get this. You better sit down when I'm going to tell you this. The librarian allowed each child to take out ten books. Wow, isn't this wonderful? They immediately had a classroom library. Uh, three weeks after the visit, they talked to the kids, they talked to the parents. Um, kids are reading more, 62% said. The parents were very impressed with the children's increase in interest in reading. They noticed improvement in the child's reading, more time with books, and most important, they asked the parent to take them back to the library, okay? Okay, I'm halfway done. I'll be done by 6.30 at the rate I'm going. Uh, part three, more reading, more literacy. And this has dominated my life since the 1980s. Study after study shows self-selected, absolutely right, Scholastic, thank you, self-selected reading, narrow reading, reading that you choose that's your taste, okay, usually includes a lot of fiction. I have really gotten more interested in fiction over the last few years, appreciated its impact. The US government, their official position, No Child Left Behind and Other Sins Against Children, says that what we want is more, 
nonfiction. They never produced any data, but I think I know why. I'm kind of like Lily Tomlin these days. My cynicism is having a hard time keeping up with the times. Why do they want nonfiction? It's easier to test, and that's where the money is. That is my suspicion. But fiction is fantastic, as we will see. By the way, I was just thinking, as uh, Lois was giving her thing about self-selection, why you got to do it yourself. Do you like getting books as gifts? I don't. Gifts are assigned reading. I never <laughs> want to read them. Vonnegut has a, a paragraph about this. He says, I walk by my shelf, and there are all these books that people have given me. They knew I was an English lit major, major so I get a lot of Jane Austen, okay? And I, see, and I see the books staring down at me, making me feel guilty. That is good evidence why reading should be self-selected. Unless it's my son, he really knows what I should be reading. No question, I trust him. I want to give you a couple of studies, which are just a tip of the iceberg, lots and lots. A study from the UK, <clears throat> University of London has been doing this long-term study looking at people since they were infants. The last time they tested them was a couple of years ago. They were 42 years old. They gave them a test of vocabulary, native speakers of English, then looked at predictors. The best predictor, of course, was how much reading you're doing now. They statistically controlled for how they did on previous questionnaires, how much reading, vocabulary size, when they were 16, whether they were read to. Yeah, those things counted, but that wasn't the cause. They controlled for all that, and you still got a powerful effect. When I get to be 42, I'm going to start reading, let me tell you. This is great. It was independent of their occupation, their parents' occupation, whether they went to college or not. It's reading that counts. The best uh, predictor, reading highbrow and middlebrow, was a better predictor than, than nonfiction. Here we go, a point for fiction. A um, study I co-authored with my colleague, Benico Mason, who teaches at a university in Japan. Uh, her students were engaged in self-selected reading program, and she helped them find the books, et cetera, under the condition that they take pre-test and post-test on a standardized examination called the TOEIC. Here's what she found. For every hour you read, you gain, we now think, 0.7 points on this test, which means you can go from zero to 60 in two years. You can become, a, from a mediocre level, just about to the top. If you do it three years, you've got what they call academic English, you've done it. So sit down with a nice cup of coffee, which is also good for your brain, read a book uh, uh, in another language, and you will make great progress, more than doing test preparation classes. Okay, that's what reading does, but it gives you other things. People who read more know more about everything. Of course, they know more about literature, they know more, more about history, science. They have more practical knowledge. This is a research team headed up by Keith Stanovich of Michigan. Uh, we have other cases like this, kids who say they only did well in school because they had access to books. The two cases, I'll just read you the details on one. Two cases are both very high poverty, very uh, difficult times, they found a source of books. Here's Elizabeth Murray, who actually was the subject of a special on TV. Very poor uh, neighborhood. She eventually went on to Harvard. Um, I'll just tell you the story. Her dad had a very interesting habit. He would go to the public libraries all around New York, the New York area, get a library card, take out all the books he could, and never return them. In those days, the libraries weren't connected by computers from library after library. The house was filled with fugitive books from all over the city. Elizabeth said that when she was in school, she played hooky most of the time. She only went to school toward the end so she could see what was on the test. And she said, this is how I sneak by from, uh, from grade to grade. Jeffrey Canada, Harvard Children's, uh, ha Harlem Children's Zone, same story. He got books from a buddy of his and from his mom. They were the source. And this is why he said he did OK in school. Um, so reading gives you <clears throat> better language, gives you knowledge, and it also gives you what we call habits of mind. This is stuff that's just come out in the last couple of years, a big article about it in Scientific American. I was very happy to see that. People who read more have more empathy for others. Fiction reading is what does that. You go through other people's experiences and you see the world for how complex it is. You don't rush for simple solutions. With that in mind, 
Let me show you a letter to the editor that I published in the Washington Post last month. I was amazed it got in. They had article after article about Donald Trump's spelling, and they blamed it on poor proofreading, two articles in a row. And one, you know, if one pe people said, why are you picking on him, blah, blah. Well, here's my letter. My letter says, poor spelling is an indication of more serious problems. Mr. Trump's mistakes reflect problems deeper than a failure to proofread. My research shows poor spelling is often the result of not having a reading habit. And those who read more know a lot more about history and science. They have greater empathy with others and understand that the world is complex. Mr. Trump is a perfect example of a non-reader. I rest my case. You're supposed to burst into wild applause. I'm sorry, you, you missed that. Come on, give me a break here. OK. <clears throat> All right. I, I've been writing him nearly every day on Twitter and Betsy DeVos constantly. It's going nowhere, but at least my followers see it. Um, to summarize all this into uh, a bigger picture, I claim poverty means uh, less access, less access, less reading, uh, and more reading, more literacy. The last set of studies I'm going to show you uh, I think are the most important studies I've ever been part of. I, did, I was part of a research team with my two former students, C. and Lee in uh, Taiwan, and Jeff McQuellen in the United States. We looked at predictors of both the NAEP exam and the PEARLS exam. These are standardized tests given to lots of kids. And we did what we called multivariate analysis, which is way cool. It's called multiple regression. For both of you who remember your statistics class, <clears throat> here's what we could do in this. We could look at the influence of predictors as if they're not correlated, as if they're independent with statistical magic. On the NAEP examination, poverty, yes. High poverty means lower NAEP scores. No question, very strong. If you put into the equation access to books, public library and school library, the access factor in the first studies we did were actually stronger. Access can make up for the effect of poverty. You should be staring open-mouthed, okay? This is amazing. We did the same thing, and, and then we replicated our results. We did the same thing with this international pearls test given to kids in 40 countries over the world, played up in the newspapers. Alfie Cohn says the results should be published in the sports section, all right? Who won, et cetera. <clears throat> well, we found the same results over and over again. The biggest predictor, of course, poverty. If you add a library, a school library of 500 books, nearly as strong as the effect of poverty. In other words, it helps balance the effect. Kids in high poverty don't read well because they don't have access to books. You have a school library, they read a lot better. We also found in all our studies that the effect of instruction of various kinds, early instruction, late instruction, was either negative or nothing. This is what counted. Um, finally, a few more random facts that support all this. When you statistically, when researchers statistically control for the effect of poverty, American test scores are nearly at the top of the world. There's nothing wrong with our teachers. We can always improve, we know that. Nothing wrong with our schools, it's not unions, it is poverty and lack of access to books. So what can we do about this? Uh, two things, and I think they're both wonderful. The first one is what Dr. King recommended, which is not radical right to left-wing communism, it's common sense. Uh, reduce and eventually eliminate poverty. This means full employment at, wage, at jo jobs that pay a decent wage that people can live, can live from. This is radical. No, it isn't. Number two, until that happens, protect children from the impact of poverty. Uh, that means three things, in my opinion, at least. Number one, food, food deprivation, good breakfast, good lunch in school, and of course, espresso machine in the teacher's lounge. <laughs> yes, okay. Number two, health care. David Berliner, his studies, high income areas have more school nurses per child than low income schools. You all know this. And it's not the crazy things, it's not the exotic things, it's things like getting dental care, making sure the kids have glasses when they need them, the ordinary everyday stuff. Number three, invest in school libraries and school librarians, which independently show better results for literacy. Our hero here, Keith, oh. 
I want to I want to mention two heroes. One is Keith Curry Lance. You know who he is? Check out Keith Curry Lance. Okay, he is. I call him the golden boy of the American School Library, so with good reason. He's been doing this stuff for years, and it's all very interesting research. The other hero uh, commenting on read-alouds, Jim Trelease, the read-aloud handbook. My, let me tell you about my mom and Jim Trelease, okay? My mom and I had a perfect relationship, let me tell you. I am my mother's son. No, I love dad, but I'm my mother's son, no question. She thought I was wonderful. She loved the way I gave speeches. She loved my writing. I had a copy of the Read Aloud Handbook in the office, and she borrowed it. She gave it back to me, and you know what she said? Stephen, why can't you write like this? <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could. This guy has done more good for libraries and reading than any single person, and we need to get people to read his book. It's still wonderful. Postscript. As Alois mentioned, there is no evidence for a serious decline in reading. Everybody keeps saying it. Close look at the da data. You see little blips here and there. Here's my analysis, which I, I, re I responded to the feds on this several times when they had these you know, horrible articles about how kids aren't reading anymore, et cetera. Uh, here's a uh, comparison, one of many we've done, comparing a 1946 report and a 2010 report on how many minutes a day kids are reading. Kids are reading, people are reading the same number of books in minutes per day of reading as they did in 1945. Fewer magazines and newspapers, everybody knows this, okay? But more websites, which we now have. Total, just about the same. There has been no serious decline in reading. The problem is poverty. Thank you. Was you? Hello. Uh, so reading across tribal nations, it's rather impossible, really, to talk about this. 560 federally recognized tribes, 100 plus tribes recognized by state governments. Just as it's difficult, if not impossible, to generalize about Indian people, it's also difficult and not impossible to take one topic or issue, such as literacy, and describe how it's being addressed across hundreds of nations. Uh, that said, let's do it anyway. Uh, reading, let's look at what traditional knowledge might be. So using that as a background to talk about reading, what is traditional knowledge? It's important to first consider what is learning in Indian country. Traditional knowledge created over time, passed down over generations, developed by the community, li living, evolving, and growing, so that within tribal communities, Learning involves a lifetime of acquiring knowledge of indigenous ways. Indigenous ways are the traditional life ways of the original peoples, also called worldview, an approach to conducting everyday life, interaction with others in philosophical or religious perspectives. The heart of efforts to support learning and reading is the complete intersection between cultural protocols of indigenous peoples and professional values in holding, collecting, providing access, and using indigenous material and intellectual content. Work with tribal nations should be entered respectfully and in ways that support indigenous worldview. And we might ask questions such as, with their focus on English and the printed word, are libraries, archives, and museums as institutions seen by tribal communities as agents of colonization? Is literacy an act of decolonization, the process of removal of the results of colonization and the return of control to indigenous peoples? Can support for reading take steps to rectify any adherence to colonial practices and attitudes? And does reading material perpetuate harmful stereotypes? Do libraries, for example, represent formal educational institutions similar to boarding schools that restricted the acceptable forms of knowledge and depressed native language and other cultural expressions? Note, though, that in the 10 years of running a service initiative with my students, if I can read, I can do anything, 
I never heard a native parent ask me to not bring English language books to their children's schools. We delivered 100,000 new books over the 10 years we ran the project. What do we know about reading in Indian country? In 1989, there was a study by the US National Commission on Libraries and Information Science, and they found significant barriers and limited access to library services by American Indians due to both cultural differences and lack of culturally appropriate resources. In 2007, just last year, Dr. Anthony Chow conducted an evaluation for the Montana State Library and their LSTA program, and he found that barriers to library services for tribal members still exist. There was little to no convenient access to either a public or tribal college library. There was little support and awareness of libraries among tribal members because their services were not typically a feature of their indigenous worldview. Note work with tribal communities, the challenges to engage adults and children and youth older than elementary school age. Chow also found that racial tension experienced by tribal members visiting public libraries in bordering tribal territory, and the lack of financial resources for tribal college librarians to prioritize early literacy programming. What's happening in Indian country? There are hundreds of tribal libraries and archives. They exist in villages in Alaska, Pueblos in New Mexico, in the Everglades in Florida, in the woodlands of Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Michigan. Reading takes place and is supported amidst the challenges. These include tribal community libraries that might serve as the public library, school library, archive, records, museum, and language center. Tribal college libraries are often the public libraries of their communities as well. And there are re reading advocates and champions. Tribal college librarians gather to share their stories for one week each year in Bozeman, Montana. American Indian Library Association members advocate and meet during the American Library Association midwinter meeting and annual conference. And every two years, a number are drawn to the International Indigenous Librarians Forum, which will note its 20th anniversary in February 2019 in Auckland, Aotearoa, New Zealand. We see new support for reading through the recipients of funding through the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Tribal libraries may receive basic grants and may compete for enhancement grants and deadlines are available at the IMLS.gov website. Uh, a few weeks ago, we learned that the IMLS will be funding a one-year planning grant called Reading Nation. That will support the following efforts. The Blackfeet Tribal College Library, in collaboration with the University of North Carolina at Greensboro, Department of Library and Information Studies, will do a number of things. They're going to establish an advisory committee to help design a study of how children, youth and families of the Blackfeet Nation currently use library services. They're going to work with that advisory committee to conduct an environmental scan to understand the current state and potential factors impacting tribal member use of library services and then design a pilot test, a community assessment process that identifies the needs and challenges that tribal members face in using public and community college libraries with a specific focus on children and new services. Our data collection starts in early July when the team, including Dr. Anthony Chow from the University of North Carolina at Greensboro, Ms. Erin Laframboy, Blackfeet Community College tribal librarian and Blackfeet tribal member, and myself will meet in Browning, Montana during the annual powwow. We will address this research question, how might libraries collaborate in creating a reading supportive environment for Blackfeet children, youth, and their caregivers. Uh, what is the current state of library services among Blackfeet tribal members, both on and off the reservation? What are the unique needs and barriers to access to library services for tribal members, with an emphasis, again, on children, youth, and families? And what are the potential challenges faced by public libraries in understanding and meeting those needs in culturally sensitive and appropriate ways? We're following a mixed method approach of qualitative interviews, focus groups, surveys, disseminated by print, smartphone text, and online. Participants were recruited using convenient sampling, collecting data at the annual powwow. 
stratified and purposeful sampling, ensuring a diverse stratum of tribal members and public librarians, and a random sample of 100 tribal members living on or off the reservation. And we're currently preparing to communicate with our advisory board in drafting the data collection instruments. We'll have more to share in a year. Uh, I'm gonna close with introducing just a couple of cases that illustrate the impact of writing and reading and including and not including, in some cases, Native people. And there aren't answers to these cases. I, I teach a class for the University of Texas at Austin and for the University of Hawaii in Manoa on access and care of, of traditional cultural knowledge. And we use these as uh, real examples of things that um, actually I experienced. So imagine you're at an author's reception at a conference and you're asked by a non-Native writer uh, about your endorsement of their latest children's book. And the writer asks, uh, tells you that she went to the reservation where the book is based and could not find anyone who could write the book as well as she did. And how might you respond um, to that question? And uh, which I avoided for three times around the, the uh, room and then um, had, to, had to face the author and describe at least what I thought of, of that book. And you can, uh, I finally had to say you're not gonna get a good review and then that, that kind of closed that conversation. Um, Let's say your professional organization is creating a product. It's a promotional calendar, and each month of the calendar is going to feature, and you hope, a native writer. And your approach, because you're the president of that association, and you will be president, and your approach saying, this would be a wonderful thing for you to advocate during your year, and it's going to, and I said, that's great. Oh, the pre whoever is asked says, that's great. Uh, and because each page will feature an author that you, you're nominating, a native writer, a, a native illustrator. And months later, you get a call saying, well, they've decided, the committee decided to go with Paul Goebel, whom you remember as someone who did receive the Caldecott Award, but who wasn't native and uh, borrowed stories from a, a tribe. And you say, that's really too bad because you can't endorse the product anymore. And the product is featured on your association's uh, uh, graphics catalog two months later in the American Indian Library Association to find out. And then um, the rest becomes a story that's published in a, in a handbook. So re read what happens next. Um, a friend of yours wants to write a children's book, former student, and has located a story from your tribe in an old anthrop anthropological report and tells you this is gonna be a great honoring experience for, for her. And I ask um, who is going to receive the proceeds. And that ends that conversation as well. Uh, and then a friend describes visiting uh, a reservation in northern Minnesota where you have a connection. And it's everything that they expected to see. Old cards, lots of dirt, and lots of dogs. Uh, so these are the sorts of things that you face and hear about. And they are contemporary. They happen within our lifetime and perhaps just last year. And they illustrate not only what, what you need to support uh, just general worldview of non-native and native people, but the sorts of barriers and challenges and opportunities that, that people have who work with native people and with native children. And I will say miigwetch, which is thank you, Chi miigwetch, thanks very much. I have to understand that Lorraine uh, speaks from great experience. You can imagine how lucky the American Library Association has been as, as uh, she has served as a really effective president for that. And I just want to then add thank you. I mean, this, this is a really you know, great panel. I have to say that because I chose them because you know, I know how wonderful they are and that they don't, and they speak, you know, they talk the talk and they walk the walk. And we're really privileged in this room you know, to see so many experts in the field. And I think we can really draw you know, from each other. I think this is going to be an excellent uh, day. We know that we'll be talking about this you know, throughout our, um, our journey together. And I certainly hope that this is a nice starting point you know, for us to continue that um, reading journey and to bring others along with us. So again, thank you for this opportunity and have a great um, day of action. Thank you.
Thanks again to that wonderful panel. I learned so much and so many notions I had about reading habits were dispelled, so thank you for that. Um, I know we're running a little late and that's because we started a little late, so if it's okay with everyone, I'm going to start the next panel and skip the break, if that's okay. Um, our next panel is Reading Promotion, What Works, What Doesn't, and Opportunities for Innovation. And the moderator of our panel is Benita Summerfield. She is a Library of Congress Literacy Awards Advisory Board member. She's former Vice Chair, Governing Board, UNESCO Institute for Lifelong Learning. And she's the Founding Executive Director of the Barbara Bush Foundation for Family Literacy. Please welcome Benita Summerfield. I'm sorry to deprive you of your break. Um, I'm Benita Summerfield, you got my background. Um, uh, Thomas Jefferson famously said, I cannot live without books. And my former boss, Barbara Bush, felt exactly the same way. And she lived it. And she walked that walk and she talked that talk. Um, and yes, I was at the funeral. Uh, Barbara Bush and I founded the Barbara Bush Foundation of Family Literacy together at the end of 1988, and I left at the end of 2011 when Barbara Bush decided she needed to step down to be with her husband, and her daughter and son uh, stepped up, and there was a new executive director. So for those of you who have been asking me, no, I don't have anything to do with the current Barbara Bush Foundation. Um, a couple of more things about what it means to be a voracious reader. And I suspect most of the people in the room are like this. Um, she didn't just pick literacy because she had to have a cause as first lady. The woman read all the time. One of my favorite stories was the famous rat in the swimming pool story. Um, somebody rigged up something that she, she used to swim laps every morning. Uh, actually, she did that her whole life. Somebody rigged up something for her when she was in the White House that she could read while she was doing laps. And somehow, who knows, um, it was a much less partisan time, so nobody blamed it on the Democrats. Somehow, a rat got into the swimming pool, and as she was reading the book, a rat came dashing by her. Um, and being a woman that really didn't deal with any nonsense and hated to be interrupted when she was reading. She promptly hauled the rat out of the pool and that was the end of that. Um, so our panel is going to talk about what works in reading promotion, not the research. What works, what doesn't work, and opportunities in this current time, in 2018, to promote reading. And just very briefly, what I'm going to say is, of course, what I've seen is that it's absolutely critical to have a strong, charismatic leader who leads the charge that urges people to read. Now, that doesn't mean it has to be a serious, eat your peas kind of message. You have to illustrate why reading is fun, why it's necessary to do your job, why it's necessary to perform in the democracy, someone whose voice can be heard. And frankly, in this world in which we're living, I have seen that we really need to have leaders, cultural leaders, culture such as it is, but the current culture, who stand up and talk about why read? Why do they read? And I'm talking about rock stars, baseball players, basketball players, football players, people that will encourage today's, not us, we read, people that will encourage today's youth to read. Years ago, there was a very effective campaign called Get Caught Reading. I don't know if any of you are old enough to remember it. I'm 73, although I'm, I know I look much younger. Um, and there were posters all over the country of movie stars, television stars, everybody, in these really funny poses saying, get caught reading, and there would be a book. Can't we have something like that today that says, get caught reading, and let me tell you why I read, or why I love books, 
and have a LeBron James, who, by the way, is a big literacy supporter, talk about why he loves books. I'm talking about posters, I'm talking about billboards, that sort of thing. Um, and yes, we do need books to be widely and easily available. Uh, another program I'm on, currently on the board of is uh, Reach Out and Read, which is a pediatric literacy program. And yes. And this again is outside the box, outside the schools, outside the traditional places where books are given out. Doctors give books at every well baby visit, from the time the child is born up to five years of age, with instruction to the parent on how to read, even if the parent isn't a brilliant reader, to the child, the interaction. And very often um, uh, you find that uh, parents, particularly parents who might come from impoverished backgrounds or be in, in an impoverished situation, don't understand how important it is for them to be reading to their children. They understand very fast once they get that first book. And they develop their own reading habits and it increases the bond between parent and child. So yes, let's make books available, but not just in all the usual places. Let's reach out and be where families, families, by the way, children go home from school, the parents are in the house, they're not living in orphanages, so if we just look at fixing the schools and don't look at what's going on between parent and child, I don't know how this is ever gonna work. Um, what have I seen that's failed? He wants, Guy wants to talk about that. What I've seen that's failed is, um, somebody talked about No Child Left Behind, it's my ex-boss's son, I know, but that eat your peas approach to reading. It's good for you, that's why you should read. Don't read books with too many pictures, don't read fiction. Read things that are definitely gonna make you, you know, stronger, but that approach doesn't work. You've got to make reading fun and relevant, and all the things they are, reading is to so many of us here in this room. Okay, enough from me. We have a wonderful panel here. I'm gonna let each person introduce, whoop. I know, right. As I wondered about that. We're not behind. We're not behind. I was threatening to cut them all off ruthlessly at 10 minutes, but I'm not gonna cut you all off ruthlessly at 10 minutes because we have until 11 o'clock. Perfect, and we'll have time. To then we're gonna have time for questions and maybe the previous panel will wanna come up and answer questions too. Um, okay, so the first person that we're going to hear from today, and if you'd introduce yourself and say what you do, um, is Deborah Taylor of the Enoch Pratt Free Library, which is a spectacular institution that I'm sure all of us have known it for years. Uh, Deborah. Hello, I am Deborah Taylor, Coordinator of School and Student Services at the Enoch Pratt Free Library. And it's my honor to be with you to talk about some of the things, some of the programs that we have um, success, that have successfully worked at the Pratt Library, and also to talk about some things that we have deemed as not so successful and that um, we are looking to improve. So with that said, I'll go to the first slide. Do I have a... The first program I want to talk about is a program called Family Reading Circles. And Family Reading Circles actually started um, with a request from the Maryland Humanities Council that wanted to do a family reading program, kind of, um, kind of um, designed after what was a big deal in those days, which was Oprah's Book Club. And what it meant was that you were bringing 
books and food together with families. And as you can see, um, this young lady has abandoned her dinner in order to examine the books that we are, that they were gonna take home. The Family Reading Circle program is a six weeks program um, that we do in branches, that we do in schools, after school programs. We've even done this program in transitional housing. Um, we have done this program in community centers. Um, and so it's, it's been in a variety of places. But the main idea of the program is that families come together once a week for six weeks. Each week, they get two high quality picture books. We read the books aloud together and discuss them. We choose books that have um, wonderful family themes, but we also choose books that are a lot of fun, have a lot of wordplay, um, so that we not only tell people that it can be fun to enjoy reading, we model it. One of the great things about this program is how many parents um, didn't have these kinds of books for themselves, and how much joy and delight they take in finding these books. You can see one of the things that we love about this program is it attracts dads, not just moms, but attracts dads. But we also encourage grandmom, um, we encourage all kinds of folks to participate. We, one big hallmark of the program is to celebrate the parents. We give the trophy to the parents. We recognize that what it takes for a parent to come after work for six weeks to be a part of a reading program is a big sacrifice and we honor them for doing that. There's a great deal of interaction between the families and the children when they come to the program. They really enjoy being a part of that, that particular activity. In addition to giving trophies to the parents, every family gets a certificate. One of the, the slides I don't have here is at the end of the program, we take a picture of the family together and they're placed in a frame called Family Readers. So that's one of the things that they take away that they will have to remind them of this great opportunity and great um, experience they had together. One of the things that we do when we have author visits at the Pratt Library is that we make sure that the students go home with books. As we heard from the previous um, panel, the most important thing is to have books and to have access to books. And we used to get questioned about that. Why are you giving people books? You should just want to give them a library card. One of the things that we know, and one of the things that I know from being a voracious reader and a voracious library reader, is that when you become a community of readers or part of the community of readers, you buy books, you borrow books, you have books, books are all around you. So we want to make sure that we um, encourage kids by having books that they can take home themselves. This particular visit was with author Z um, Zeta Elliott, she came to Baltimore, she did a number of um, programs in our schools, and this on these tables are uh, goodie bags that the kids are gonna take with them after her visit. When we started doing uh, increasing author visits for kids, Dr. Carla Hayden was our director, and when we would propose author visits, she said, where are the kids are gonna get the author books? How are they gonna get their book signed? Everybody who goes to hear an author gets a book signed. What are you gonna do about that? So we, we had to find the money to make sure that we could make sure those kids got their book signed, they'd had the full experience. This is author um, Sharon Flake. We work in partnership with one of our, um, there's a special project in Baltimore called the Weinberg Project, and these are renovated school libraries, and we have a partnership with them so that when we bring authors to town, we go into those schools. Um, despite the fact that those schools have brand new school libraries, lots of technology, great collections, a full-time librarian, they don't have as much opportunity for author visits. So that's something that we do with them. So we make sure that we take our authors to visit those schools. Um, 
Wes Moore, who is a prominent, uh, was a prominent Baltimorean, I think he's gone to New York now, um, but every year he would come to the Pratt Library and he would talk to the kids about service. Well, you know, he has also written books. So we, we would bring students into the library. We go out to the library to promote books, out of the library to promote books, and we bring students in to the library. And these students had all come from various schools throughout the city that had service learning project because that was a big focus of his. And they had an opportunity to meet with him, to get their books, and to get books signed. One of the things that hasn't worked for us has been too much passive um, programming for parents. Um, one of the, we showed you the positive that one of the things that really worked well in our Weinberg School Libraries, bringing the authors in, having them engage with students, students getting books to take home. Well, we have small collections in each of those schools and we call them the Pratt Library's Parents Place. And we have wonderful collections of how to help your child in school, how to read to your child, all of those kinds of things. But the passive displays for many parents don't work as well as something that is much more engaging. So we are already taking steps to make the Enoch Pratt Free Library Parents Place less of a place with books and more of a programmatic engagement for parents so that they really can have an opportunity to interact with our staff and to get those skills rather than just buying books about those skills and making them available. And that's the end of my presentation. That was terrific. Thank you. Um, our next presentation will be from Alistair Chang, from, who is the CEO of Libraries Without Borders, and he won um, the international prize of our competition um, at, the, at the Library of Congress Literacy Awards Program. Uh, and I'm the chair of the International Committee, so we picked him. And I'm, so I'm doubly delighted to see him here today. Thank you. Go. All right. Hello, everybody. Um, thanks, for, thanks for having uh, all of us, Library of Congress, and, and everyone at the Center for the Book. Um, this, is, uh, this is exciting. So I, I've got a lot to share, and I'll try not to talk until 11.45. Um, so who are we? Libraries Without Borders is a, is a nonprofit that's focusing on expanding access to information, particularly in the most vulnerable communities. And um, I'll, I'll read the statement because we've, we've just hashed this out and uh, uh, there's always a tension between how we translate this from French to English. Um, so any, any advice you have is great. We believe that information and education empower people and give them the ability to make enlightened choices for a better future. To achieve that goal, we build bridges between the information society, which is us, and those who are excluded from it. And our scope of intervention since 2007 has been uh, classified, I think, in, in three pillars. We've been really thinking about humanitarian contexts, places where that have suffered from natural or political disasters. Um, we've been focusing on education and literacy, and also, using our library spaces for entrepreneurship programs. So the last time I had an opportunity to speak here, uh, we were really in the sort of uh, focusing on our flagship program, which is called the Ideas Box. And this is something that we built learning from work that we had done in Haiti after the earthquake. One of the biggest challenges that we had um, was really in the supply chain, right? Books getting wet during transportation, not having storage or security when it arrives to a place that has just suffered from a natural disaster or to a refugee camp um, in the African Great Lakes. So we built this with uh, support from Philip Stark's design team, um, something that could be easily deployed in these contexts, something that could be fit on two standard transportation pallets, waterproof during transportation, unfolds into these modules that eventually becomes a full-sized media center. 
um, with the support from the International Literacy Award, uh, we've been able to grow this out now to, uh, we've got now uh, over 100 around in the world, um, reaching over a million people, and um, with over uh, 28,000 different kinds of curated content that we customize for each context. Um, the, the, the sort of flagship program has been Burundi in, in refugee camps where we've partnered with UNHCR. But we've also done programs, um, uh, last year our largest program was in Colombia as part of the peace building initiatives with the Ministry of Culture and the National Library. And uh, coming up we'll be having a few ideas boxes in Puerto Rico as part of the disaster relief efforts there. Um, thinking about how informal education can support the other organizations with working with the kids that are still not back in school. Our goal is to have um, many, many more of these out in the field to support our local partners. And I'm, I'm, I, you know, I think for all of you here who are prospective implementing partners, would love to talk more with you about this. How can the Ideas Box potentially support your efforts um, in, in, these, in these tough contexts. But what I really want to talk with you about today, which we haven't, I haven't gotten a chance to, to share uh, here in, in, at, at the library yet, is our new initiative. Um, and uh, this will be more of a story. So um, in 2015, we had the Ideas Box in New York, in the South Bronx, where we were working with the New York Public Library to create pop-up libraries around the city. And we had an ethnographer from NYU follow us for six months, thinking through uh, and, and, and trying to explore what are some of the challenges that families have with accessing library programs. So we set up the ideas box in public parks, lobbies of low-income housing, uh, legal aid waiting offices, hospitals, barber shops, street corners, subway stations. And one of the things that we were finding when we were interviewing families was um, that there's a, there's a very big difference between the availability of programs and resources and the accessibility of those programs. And one of the, one of the main barriers that we found was really a scheduling barrier in terms of participation. Um, offering a literacy program that meets 6 p.m. every Tuesday is really, really tough for families uh, that rely on service industry jobs, right? You can't afford to miss a shift. You miss one of the classes, you're embarrassed to go back. One of the main reasons why a lot of the families we talked to were not able to bring their kids or, or for themselves to participate in uh, not only library programs, but a lot, of, uh, a lot of literacy opportunities. But this raises a huge challenge, right? Because um, those, those, of course, are gonna be the most tested uh, you're going to have much more evaluation opportunity at a physical site than if you're out in the community. Um, and also, uh, it's, it's much harder to, to design, right? If you don't know how many people are going to show up, you don't know what ages they are, you don't know what their reading level is going to be. And so we, we've been exploring this now for the last three years, really, trying to kind of think through how do we work with our library partners to think about uh, outreach, and I, and I use that word uh, acknowledging that it can be defined in, in so many different ways. Um, we had one, one of our library partners said, you know, outreach is meaningless uh, in, in some ways because so much of the work we have to do is, is, has to be embedded in the community to begin with, right? Um, what we found was that one of the best, best places to do this work was in laundromats. And um, so laundromats are, are really interesting spaces because you have to go every week if you don't have a washer dryer at home and you're there for 90 minutes on average. In the winter, if, it's, if you're in a cold place, you're going more than once a week, especially if you have many kids. Um, and the more layers, the more laundry you have to wash. And what's been interesting, uh, the, the, there's been no day of the last two years that I haven't said the word laundromat, and so <laughs> I've been learning a lot about the industry. It's a growing, it's a growing industry, which I think is, is really interesting um, for those of us who aren't in that space. Uh, 
the revenues and profits of laundromat owners has been going up, I think, as a consequence of rising poverty. What you see in these spaces is um, really, you know, sometimes if you're on a college campus, of course, you get college students, but for the most part, you're really, the, the clients of the laundromat are lowest income, can't save the capital $500 to have a washer dry at home, live in a space that is too small, right? Um, or in a building that, that doesn't have those amenities. And so over the last year, what we've been doing is partnering with our local library branches, state, county, and city libraries, as well as, um, uh, most excitingly, uh, a trade group called the Coin Laundry Association. And they have over 30,000 uh, small business members across the country. And um, we're trying to turn now all 30,000 of those member sites into extensions of their local library. What I love about this is that we're trying to think through uh, how to build out these public-private partnerships at the really hyper-local level, right? Because when you really think about it, I don't think that the innovation behind this is a product, right? Um, as we've been exploring this, we found that Chicago Public Library has been doing laundromat programs for the last 20 years. And um, so, so we brought over 15 other organizations that have been doing these siloed laundromat programs together um, to meet in Chicago with the Coin Laundry Association to build out the tools and capacity building for any other organization that wants to do this themselves. I think that the reason why we want to focus on that rather than as Libraries Without Borders build out our own laundromat sites and operate them is uh, pretty obvious to me, which is that you know I myself won't know the contexts, what texts to curate, what challenges people are facing as well as our local partners. Um, and what, what's dynamic about these hyper-local public-private partnerships between a small business, really mom and pop shop, and not even necessarily a library system, but a library branch, is that they can be super, super dynamic with changing needs, right? So um, when new questions come up, you change the content. Uh, last month, a lot of the, the library systems found that people were asking a lot of tax questions, and so we're trying to teach literacy through uh, helping people sort through those, those tax questions, a lot of that is local. When uh, I, I spoke with uh, one parent, one mother in, in one of the laundromat sites in Detroit that we have, and, and, and this, is, this is getting to a, a more macro level question that I have for this group, which is, you know, we, we, we've had this prompt of, of talking about what programs work, what, what programs don't, how do we define success in our case, right? Because um, literacy rates are certainly one quantitative way to measure it, but, but I'd like to get at something that's a little bit more emotional and social, and how, how do we define that? So when I was in Detroit, I spoke with one parent who was um, participating regularly in the laundromat literacy programs, and she said, you know, her story was she had, um, she was a single mom, had just moved to Detroit. Uh, she had moved with her boyfriend at the time. Um, he had left her. She didn't know anyone else in Detroit. She'd been there now for a year. And this was, she said, the first time that anyone had spoken to her and asked her how she was doing. And, and it, re it really stuck with me because I think one of the, one of the main barriers that I think a lot of people have with accessing existing resources, right, is this, is this social, social and emotional barrier. If you don't have the social networks that are opening you to these opportunities, if you don't have, if you don't think that that space is for you, it doesn't matter how well we design the program inside um, if, if people don't feel like they can use it. And so, how can we, as a community, uh, focusing on literacy, think about not only generating good content and making it available, but also think about how we can think about these softer elements uh, to make them ex actually accessible. Uh, one other finding that we've, we've had is um, thinking about how we curate content, and this gets back to why I think this sort of hyper-local public-private partnership is really exciting. I think that there's a big difference between comprehensive information and relevant 
information. And so in the laundromats where we've been putting, not yes, not only a bookshelf, but also uh, what we've been doing is putting, uh, moving one of the folding stations out, putting four laptops or desktop computers with a curated Wi-Fi hotspot. I think that there's a big difference between providing open access to internet and curating the space to be a really education-focused, literacy-focused corner of the laundromat where Wi-Fi is really curated uh, around our content partners, PBS Kids, Too Small to Fail, um, really thinking about how we curate that content so that it's timed between wash and dry cycles, thinking about how we can um, have this intergenerational conversation happening in that space. and answering people's most urgent questions. So um, what we've been finding is instead of having this set curriculum, and this again gets to a really, really tough uh, challenge for an evaluation, instead of answering, uh, providing, you know, this is the curriculum for the laundromat, what we've been doing is convening local organizations to activate the laundromat as a community anchor, right? A, a community center of sorts during the laundromat's busiest hours. And if, for those of you that haven't been to a laundromat recently, some of them can have 200 washers, 200 dryers. On the weekends, you have over 300 families at any given time that you can be working with. And so the demand is, is so much greater than the supply when we bring our librarians there. Um, but, but thinking through, you know, people that we've been having these conversations with and, and running this program with have something very urgent that they need to do that day. How can we make sure that the literacy curriculum, especially, and the digital literacy curriculum that we're providing is taught experientially to answer that question, right? How do you not just use literacy to read a fiction book, but how do you use it to find health information, sign up for health insurance, figure out how to do your taxes, um, and learn all those other skills, uh, which I think literacy is the only way you open the, the door to, to those opportunities for. And so I'd like to end on a, a couple just final closing thoughts, which, uh, you know, it, again, is not rocket science. These have been tried and tested and, and explained by others, but what we're finding as we're trying to work on this piece of the supply chain of knowledge um, is, is really been, been on our mind, is that the availability of programs and content does not necessarily mean that it's accessible, and that comprehensive libraries are not necessarily relevant. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Alistair. I think you can see why he won the award. Okay, our final panelist is Rachel Walker, and her background is very different. She's uh, worked with um, Reading Rockets, which is a public television, what should we call it, reading, reading program, reading awareness program. Everybody wins a whole bunch of programs of that ilk. Again, out of the box a bit. And uh, Rachel, I think, rather than representing one organization, she'll speak from her broad experience. Yeah, I represent a lot of different folks, um, which has been exciting for me over the 30 years of my career in children's literacy. Um, I'm here today really representing Reading Rockets, which is a national project of WETA, the flagship public television station here in our nation's capital, which you may know for PBS NewsHour, Ken Burns documentaries. But WETA really about 15 years ago had this idea that it would, it would be a good idea to take advantage of this internet thing and to use that to disseminate some of the best reading research that's out there because we know that educators and parents want that information. And so we started with you know, what the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development and the National Reading Panel were working on to really determine what is the best in teaching reading. And we took that information and what we know best, which is the power of storytelling um, through, through public television, and turned it into something to try to really demystify the reading research, because that's really important. Um, teaching reading is complex, 
and it needs to be responsive to the needs of, of each child. So we're not doing the PowerPoint. No? That's all right. I can talk without pictures. No? Okay. So what I want what I want what I wanted to say in terms of why I feel like Reading Rockets is such an important reading promotion partner in, in the literacy community is that we, we need to remember that we, we've got to speak to that, that reading instruction um, is important. Uh, high quality reading instruction, break down those barriers uh, so that you are ready to read to learn. Um, sometimes I feel like that's kind of obvious that it doesn't get mentioned, but we really do need to remember that we have kids who aren't going to love reading. And one of the reasons that they might not love reading or might avoid reading is because they haven't mastered it. They haven't mastered decoding to become fluent. Um, they haven't gotten interested in learning new words or looking at new ideas. And they're really frustrated. So reading promotion helps kind of create those entry points for those kids who are learning or those kids who are striving. Uh, we have to look at ability and inclination. So one of, the, one of the projects that I've been involved in through Reading Rockets, but also just because I'm really interested in reading and getting kids excited about reading, was when I was actually uh, working with Miss Linda Johnson Robb at Reading is Fundamental. I started uh, partnering with the National Education Association when they launched Read Across America. Who knows what Read Across America is? Yes. Who knows who wrote, you're never too old, too wacky, too wild, to pick up a book and read with a child? Who, who, so say it. Who wrote it? Dr. Seuss did not write that. I'm so sorry to, to tell you that that was written by an NEA staff person. Uh, and you can see it all over the internet, credited to Dr. Seuss. But no, that belongs to uh, Anita Marina, who authored that little rhyme. And, and, and it was the rhyme that, that NEA was attracted to um, by Dr. Seuss. And of course, the hat. You know, as, as Benita was saying with the Get Caught Reading campaign, it's, it's that oddness, that juxtaposition of you know, a Supreme Court justice wearing a cat in the hat hat that's going to get your attention um, and make you think, oh, maybe this is something that I should be paying attention to. But, but NEA really felt like Dr. Seuss epitomized you know, a love of children and a love of learning and this, this fun, fantastical rhyme. And, and, and looking in the, um, the book that we have, the report from Scholastic, you see Dr. Seuss is all over that. Um, so he, he's dear to many folks and, and that's great. And it really has, for 20 years, Read Across America has generated participation annually from about 45 million adults and kids reading together, which is, which is tremendous. It's on the map. So, so that's great. That's been working. We've gotten kids excited about reading. And yet, it was time to change. NEA really recognized that change was needed. It was the hat that was starting to get all the attention. It wasn't what kids needed or what adults wanted to do in their interactions with kids. So NEA really took the opportunity to say, we need to do more. We need to do more than a one day celebration on Dr. Seuss's birthday. We need to launch readers year round and we need to give them access to both those windows and mirrors. And have for the past several years really placed a greater emphasis on the year round literacy with an annual calendar and annual resources that focus on building a nation of diverse readers. So looking at, at books by Native Americans, by folks from all walks of life to kind of get the story out. And hopefully what that's going to do is in, encourage more diversity, encourage more diversity in publishing, and encourage more diversity in kids reading. Um, the other 
the other hat that I've been wearing lately is as a program director for a nonprofit here in DC called Everybody Wins. And Everybody Wins was started about 25 years ago here in DC by um, folks right over here on Capitol Hill. Um, Senator Kennedy, Senator Jeffords realized that right in the shadow of the Capitol folks um, were not learning to read. Kids were not being read to, they didn't have access to books, their school library was locked. So they decided one of the things that they could do was go over during their lunch hour and read to kids. And we found that that worked, that having a kid and, a book, and an adult and a book share and spend time together actually made a difference. Um, Everybody Wins in DC now serves about 1,000 kids with readers from all over the city, from all walks of life, and we make sure that kids are taking books home so that we're improving their access to books at home. But what's really key are those shared reading experiences, and they're, they're building connections that are lasting a lifetime. I, I recently met a young man who called to say, that 20 years ago he had been a student at Thompson Elementary School in DC and he wanted to know how could he now become a reading mentor because his reading mentor had meant so much to him. His reading mentor had worked in the automobile industry and guess what this young man does now? He works as a lobbyist for the National Automobile Manufacturing Association. So this, this mentor had an impact that has influenced his life, influenced his career path, and now he was ready to give back. So bringing these, these shared reading experiences that build that kind of confidence, that build that kind of background knowledge and, and strengthen those socio-emotional skills that we all want kids to have is so critical. Um, but there's so much more that we felt like we could do through the shared reading experiences and the opportunities to engage kids. One of our, one of Everybody Wins additional partnerships in the city focuses on uh, bringing authors to schools with a partnership with an Open Book Foundation, which is a nonprofit here in DC that takes advantage of the fact that DC is full of authors and that authors come to DC all the time. And so, why not take them to schools that are under-resourced and might really benefit from that opportunity? Um, we're, we're ready now, this is our innovation. We're ready to take that a step forward and not just have authors come into the schools, you know, here, here's an author, yay, here's a book, yay, I got a new book and the author signed it. But to move that um, forward so that we're continuing the learning after the experience, so that kids are doing their own writing, so that kids are doing more research on what they've learned and talked about with the author. And we're, we're very excited to see what's gonna happen with that and how we can further engage the school community in those opportunities by involving parents, by involving our reading mentors so that they are also getting a chance to come and speak and talk about what it is they do and what it is they're excited about reading because it's, it's an excited adult reader that is an excellent example for a kid. You know, seeing adults around them choosing reading and choosing reading as a fun activity is, I don't, I don't know how else we can replace that. And I think that's why Read Across America was, is so successful for so many years because if an adult in your life is willing to put on a crazy hat and spend time reading with you, then you know there's something to that. And I'm hoping that we'll be able to continue to find exciting entry points like that for folks from all walks of life and that we'll all be working together on this reading promotion opportunities because it makes more sense if we're all sharing that information and all kind of supporting each other as we do this work. I love, I love Reach Out and Read. I'm so glad that you mentioned that, Benita, because I think that that's one of the strongest reading promotion programs that's out there. And they need help, and everyone needs help, and we're doing a lot of the things that we all know are right, but we can learn from each other, and I really appreciate that we're given the opportunity to talk to each other and talk about our mistakes, because those are the things we want to avoid. Thank you all so much.
Thank you, Rachel, uh, for sharing your very creative ideas from, those, from your work with those very creative organizations. Again, out of the box. Now, Guy, should we open the floor to questions and then, and then can, do you want, would you like to also? So it's 11 o'clock, we have until 11.45. So we'll take, and let them come up also afterwards. <laughs> okay, questions. Hi. Um, Laura Balin, I'm one of the Literacy Advisory Board members. Um, this has been really great already this morning. So a couple of questions. Um, Alistair, I'm thinking about the laundromat issue, which I absolutely love. And, but I'm also thinking about, um, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting your name, the, the woman from the Enoch Pratt Library. Okay. Um, and, and your really important point that just creating sort of passive centers doesn't work very well. So in the laundromat scenarios, is there a staff person there that is guiding or um, prompting or teaching or, or doing something so that it is an active learning center? So if you could maybe comment on that, both of you, if, if you have that. So, so for us, um, we've, we've also um, started to learn more and more about the, the challenges of, a, of just having the space. So, um, we found that, you know, like One Laptop or Child uh, and a lot of the, the programs that existed in international development that we've tried to learn from, just putting the tools in a place doesn't necessarily lead to the educational impact that we want to see. It might lead to some other things, connectivity, um, digital access, right? What we've been doing is uh, playing around with different, for different contexts, different levels of nudges where if you sign on to the Wi-Fi that we provide at the laundromat, like at the airport, you get a portal, pops up on your personal device, brings you straight to PBS Kids, right? WQED or something of the sort um, with a kind of caption that says, you know, here's a 15-minute activ activity that you can do with your child while you're at the laundromat. Very kind of, very, very clearly laid out. So there's the nudges, and then I think there's the restrictions, right? Um, if you block every site except PBS Kids at that laundromat. Um, there's, there's that piece too. And so, <laughs> so we, we've been playing around with that because it's, it's, uh, it's something that we'd like to, to test more um, uh, with different content partners. Um, th there's the content curation piece. But then the, the, main, the main impact is really coming from the facilitators, right? When we have uh, the librarians actually on site leading programs with that, those tools is when we see the highest engagement. The challenge, of course, again, is HR is, is, is the most, usually the most expensive and uh, lowest supply um, resource. And so for us, it's really thinking through how can the technology amplify what they're already doing and extend the reach of who they can, can work with. Um, but at this point, we are still, uh, even with those technologies, even with those nudges, um, mostly working on convening, right? Convening facilitators to come, Kiwanis um, uh, and volu other volunteer groups to come and actually lead workshops at the laundromat sites. shouldn't be, but anyway. <laughs> um, I am a librarian, and I used to book talk to middle school, so I'm sure I can project. Um, but the, you know, many schools, the school structure, the physical layout of the school can sometimes be a barrier to putting up a display for parents. Those libraries where the library was across the hall from the, from the office, they got more parental attention. Um, so it really did depend on things like that. So what we have been able to do is we've been able to hire an outreach, a program assistant who is outreach specialist in pre-K through grade five uh, outreach 
for our schools so that we can do some more work around parental engagement and connecting those parents back to both the school library and the public library so that we're kind of working together and reinforcing that idea. But it, it just happened to be that that particular exhibit or a display, depending on the layout of the school, was going to have varying degrees of success. I have, a, I have a question, too. Uh, oh. So I was so fortunate to be able to go to the Laundry Cares Foundation meeting <laughs> and as a representative of uh, actually being on the board of Libraries Without Borders. But Alistair, if, can you tell us what happens at the largest laundromat in the world? Part of, one of the tours we took as part of that, that meeting was to the largest laundromat in the world. All right, so the, this is outside of Chicago. They have uh, over 300 washers, 300 dryers. They have an aviary bird center so the families can watch the birds. They have um, a clown who's hired part-time to come every afternoon and, and weekends. Um, yep. The owner does pizza every two, two two times a week every evening um, and, and really already, you know, I think the partnership between laundromats and libraries is really interesting because already uh, laundromats are in some ways community anchors, right? And so the fit is, 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 is really uh, easy to find the connections with. Um, thanks for sharing that, Lorraine. <laughs> Thank you. Other questions? So I have a related question. Um, this laundromat thing is fascinating. So I'm interested in hearing, I'm taking Laura's question a little bit further, is the outreach, and I understand you define that kind of liberally, but is that meant to stay within the laundromat and is it a space constriction? Is there some kind of hope to convert to library cards or move to a library for a different kind of programming? Can you talk about that a little bit? Thank you. So, so we've been doing free laundry days with um, sponsorship. It's a, it's a great way to build new sponsorships with corporations that haven't funded libraries in the past. Um, four hours free laundry. Laundry is five, ten dollars a uh, five dollars a load usually. So it's, it it adds up for families. Um, one connection that I found that's really interesting is a lot of the kids say uh, have said that they are embarrassed to go to school if their laundry is not clean. So there's there's other dignity elements to it too. But with free laundry, what we do is. Um, uh, partner with a laundromat, provide free laundry for four hours. We usually have a three, four hour line outside the block, invite local organizations to come, sign people up for their programs, um, and sign people up. In order to get free laundry, you have to have a library card, right? And it's an easy, another nudge restriction that we put on, uh, <laughs> which I know is not the most. It's, it's a little bit of the eat your peas, but I think if we have a clown there, it's kind of, it's fun. <laughs> Um, so uh, my uh, question is to Dr. Roy, uh, but really could be answered by anyone. I so appreciated um, her comments about uh, being careful that we're not colonizing, that, that when we're trying to partner with organizations and, and communities, that we're not um, bringing our own values. And I see the challenge of that is that we're bringing support to a community because we believe that we have solutions that can support that community. But if we're not really partners and listening and a part of that, we very much are just placing our values on top of them. So I really appreciated that. And I'm just wondering what has worked or not worked um, in, for you or for anyone else in, in making community partnerships that really, truly partner with the community. Oh, great. That's a great question. I guess I'll use an example. Uh, some years ago, the State Library in Arizona had a supplemental grant to their Bill and Melinda Gates funded technology centers. And so they provided some funding to hire a community tech in six or eight tribal settings in Arizona. Uh, Hopi Reservation, there was one on, um, uh, let's see, uh, I think uh, Tona Odom. There were so different locations, tribal locations. And I was the evaluator for the project. And each site also had a, uh, a student intern from the University of Arizona. And so I got to meet with all the technology people, all the, the community people. I remember going to a chapter house on Navajo, and a Navajo woman, Dene woman, sat next to me very quietly and then pushed something toward me. And it was a huge notebook, 
and it was filled with all the things she had learned to do at that center. And she had started for the first time, her own way of earning money was to produce uh, graduation cards. And she learned Photoshop, and she learned how to print, and she didn't say a word, but she showed me everything. And so I got to hear what patrons did in those sites. But speaking with the students, I also got to learn a little bit about the motivation, more about the motivation of why did they volunteer to go and work and support a community tech person from in their own tribal community, and the students were non-native. And I remember the first student who wanted to speak to me, she said, I need 20 minutes of the hour. And what she talked about is what she felt she should have experienced but didn't. She says, I should have been brought into the, to the uh, sacred uh, religious experiences. I want, you know, her demands were great. And I had already spoken to the people at those sites, so I kind of had a heads up of what the students were going to say. And I said, so why did you want this? And she says, well, my dad was an Indian Health Service physician, and 20 years ago, that was his experience. And then I, another young student said, uh, and then they, they had complaints. They said, you know, I showed up on the day I was supposed to be there, and nothing happened. No one knew I was coming. And so there was, that was a common experience. But I knew one of the students had been a star. And they, they didn't know I'd already heard from their sites. And we got to this student, and I said, so what was your experience? She says, oh, like everyone else, I went on the day I was supposed to and no one was there. She said, but I went the next day. And she said, and I went the following week. And what she did was her expectations were she was there to help. And she was not there to gain some inside track. So a part was the motivation. Um, I think the many gifts come from, from uh, being involved in community level, but it's not something you can say, I'm going to do this, so I'm, I'm going to cherry pick some cultural experience so I can talk about it in 20 more years. So, you know, I, I have a, uh, one of the books I've written, there is a chapter on examining one's motivation, and everyone needs to, needs to do that as well. Um, so does that help answer the question a little bit? Okay, thanks. Uh, this is a question for anybody, but maybe Alistair uh, would be the best. Or, um, you know, I come mostly from an international background. When you travel around the world, you hear ministers and librarians say, uh, talk about a reading culture. So even in the Gulf, for example, the Arab world, where people are quite wealthy, um, they say, well, we don't really have a reading culture. Whereas if you go to Russia, for example, people, even the relatively poor people, are, they're great readers. Is there anything in this idea of a reading culture, or is it just as Dr. Cashin said, um, you know, if you're poor, you don't read, and if you're, if you're not poor, you, you read more? Or is, is, there a, is there a body of research on that, and is it relevant to the United States? my career. Wonderful. Uh, if they have access to books and they're still not reading, we can talk about the absence of reading culture. But as James Patterson has just quoted and pointed out, it may very well be the case that non-readers are simply those who haven't found the right books yet. Great study I would like to see replicated in the laundromat. It was called Spider-Man in the Library. I forgot the author's name. They put comic books in a library for junior high school children, did not allow them to circulate. You had to go to the library to read the comic. Library traffic went up, doubled. Books taken out went up 30% in a very short time. When we bring in books, they really, really, really want to read. And the best thing out now for young people, comic books and graphic novels, no question. One of the great things about being on the airplane, I get to catch up on the Marvel movies. Oh my gosh, Wonder Woman, Black Panther, serious, philosophical discussions. Uh, Wonder Woman is about the nature of evil. I'm going to spoil it for you. Black Panther is on the nature of justice. How do we do this? Is it correct when you are born into wealth, when you're given it? What is your obligation? Okay. These are heavy things, and that's what people, it's framed in such a brilliant way that people get involved in literature and reading. So let's ask the question when we've, about reading cultures, when we've solved the access problem? Great question. That's 
it's really an important question because I remember hearing the commercial um, read to your child 15 minutes a day and I used to think um, nobody ever read to me but my grandmother was a storyteller and so it's not so much just the culture of reading, is it a culture of storytelling? And how do you incorporate that so those stories are captured and passed down? So one of the things that we do with family reading circles is um, when we close out, sometimes we have a visiting illustrator, sometimes we have a visiting author, but sometimes we have a visiting storyteller. Because one of the things that, we, that if you observe how parents interact with their children now, they are always giving them directions. They're seldom really telling them things or, or storytelling anymore. My grandmother told me stories constantly whenever we were together. So I think the culture of storytelling is the one we want to really encourage. And if it means writing down those stories and capturing them and sharing them, then that, I think, helps with the whole prospect of a reading culture. Thank you. Can I add a friendly amendment? A friendly short amendment? to your wonderful comment. We, cult, stories are what makes the world go round. All, everybody likes stories constantly. Uh, let me give you some advice for your social life. If you're invited to a party and you don't know anybody, watch the three latest movies. You can always go up to someone and say, I just saw, you know, Iron Man 26, you know, or whatever. <laughs> and, or, or the, you know, our latest Arnold movie. And you can get a reasonable conversation going because people want to know about stories. We interpret our lives as a narrative where we are the protagonist. So, absolutely. Thanks for that. I think it is an important addition, but one of the things that, that has worried me about when we talk about creating a culture around reading is I've asked so many people over the years, are you a reader? Do you consider yourself a reader? Do you like reading? And most of the time, the answer I get is no. I don't like reading. I don't like reading at all. And then I say, but, but do you read? What do you read? Oh yeah, I read all the time. I read newspapers, I read this, I read journals, I read, they don't read fiction. So I don't, I don't wanna, mm -hmm. I, I totally agree about storytelling, but my concern is, is that we've, you read to your child 15 minutes a day, gives you that image of I'm sharing a Dr. Seuss book with you, or I'm sharing a story with you, and I don't want to leave out those folks who come at it in a different way. There's research, there's research on gossip and stories. Most of what goes on in newspapers is human interest. When Albert Einstein talked to other physicists, they talked about their personal lives, stories, and gossip. I still maintain stories is what makes the world go round. And then just to even broaden it more, I think you can also talk about song. So just recently, awards on literature were, you know, uh, Bob Dylan won earlier, you know, Ira Gershwin. So again, these are gateways. The storytelling, the songs, the rhythms that we have are all gateways to literacy. I've heard parents say that their children, or there's particularly this, this, this occurs with, with boys, that all he wants to do is study baseball or basketball statistics. And I tell them he's creating the narrative in his head from those statistics. He is a reader, but he is, he is going after his storyline, his narrative in a different way than I might, who you know, was a voracious reader of trashy romance novels. So it just really does, you know, you really have to respect the reader where the reader is. And then I think people see themselves as part of that culture. Just speaking to the scholarly culture, I just wanted to mention one of the most significant studies of all at the University of Nevada. Mariah Evans, uh, who's a sociologist, found that even just 12 books in the home created what she called a scholarly culture. And I think what she meant is that if you have books in the home, you're talking about the books, you're reading the books, you're sharing the books with each other. And we find that parents who may not have had access to literacy um, as children themselves, if their children are bringing books home, then they're learning to read. Um, the children who have the books in the home are reading aloud to their younger siblings. So you've, it, it's the talk, as everyone is saying, around the books, that is so critically important. And also, by the way, reading aloud to children is 
so important, we know, but again, it's the talk about the read aloud, you know, bringing out the child's personal engagement with the book that really makes the difference. So in the end, it all comes back again to access to books. If you have access to books, anything's possible. Add a couple things. Uh, when we ran, when we ran to the reading club for Native kids, I would go to tribal schools and we would uh, certainly read books, but we always did the storytelling too. And I know that uh, the the secret to getting Native kids to pay attention is to say you're going to tell them a ghost story, and you're going to tell them ghost stories that you yourself experienced and they're really true. And then I always told the true ghost stories. And, but for Native kids, one difference would be that uh, just like storytelling is social, reading is very social for Native children. And board books, you think of board books as the ba books that you give babies, but we found that kids up to fourth grade would use the board books because they would sit with other children, especially younger ones, and they would go through the books together. And they would form their own little pods of reading. They knew, especially in those schools where kid had read kids had reading level, uh, to know that they knew everybody's reading level, and they would help each other select the books. Like, oh, no, no, you want to read this, you want to read that. So reading as a culture is very communal, just like storytelling is communal with um, native, native schools, especially. I just have one comment I'd like to make. Um, I need to speak up for the adults, since nobody is. Um, what we found uh, in the Barbara Bush Foundation, we funded about a thousand programs over the years. Uh, many parents who were not interested in investing in themselves for a variety of reasons, mostly none of them very good about self-concept, cared to learn to read so they could read to their children. I agree with you, it's the conversation that matters, but I really, I worked in programs before I ran a foundation, you know, during the Great Society stuff, in prisons and in homeless shelters and whatever. I don't, I don't, I, we did family literacy programs in prisons. I don't, I don't think, this is going to sound crazy, I don't think I ever ran into a parent that didn't want to be able to learn to read, to read a book to his or her child. And reading in this context doesn't necessarily mean that you have to have fantastically developed reading skills. It's be with the child, turn the pages, tell the story. And that often incites a desire to learn to read on the part of the adults because it's for the relationship with the child. I just to throw that in. Sorry. Go ahead. Hi. Um, so my my office, we do museum education, and so I'm listening to all of you, and we're probably not going to get books into children's hands as much. We're doing more digital outreach. Um, is there, can you recommend, do you have just off the top of your head maybe strategies for what we should be creating, or how maybe should we be reaching out to parents? Should we be reaching out to libraries? What's our best approach to help kids? I'll just use one example, since, since this is just down the street, the National Museum of American Indian. So I was involved with a group that created the first online exhibits for the museum, working with eight, nine, and 10 year olds. And so my job was to help the children narrate a tour of the museum materials on exhibit that were removed from exhibition cases. We created 360 degree movies of the objects, linked them to panoramic views of the exhibit space, and then the kids narrated the tour. But we used that following a neural history model of asking, I asked the children to describe who created the object, where were they from, how did they create it, and for what purpose. And they used written materials as well as their own cultural stories to do the interpretation. So that was for um, the NMEI. So. Any other responses to that? So with, with PBS and Reading Rockets, we are definitely a digital platform, and so we've done a lot at looking at what, what that means and how is that really useful. Uh, and we found that one of the things that is great is, of course, video, because video is very accessible. Uh, you can tell a lot of stories with video. But also we found that it works even better if you take that video and you put it into action so that if it's digital and you're communicating with folks all over the world, 
they can learn how to use that video to the best that it can be used. So to share it with a parent or to use it as part of a professional development opportunity for a teacher. So it can't just, we don't want it to just be static and there online. We know people will find it and use it. But to have that kind of outreach and those opportunities where you're saying, here, here are a lot of different ways that you can put it into action in your community. Hi, well, I'm really interested in, Rachel, and what you were saying, and y'all, some of y'all have alluded to this, with the, the power of process in children going from author visits or a book experience and making their own narrative and what that looks like. So I just wanted to know if you could talk a little bit more about that, that, that process. So one of, the, one of the reasons that I was really excited about working with Everybody Wins and the idea of doing more to engage uh, kids through shared reading experiences that were not necessarily just one-on-one, -on -one, but looking at that kind of community that you build when you're sharing a book that's the same and sharing the experience of getting to meet the author. Uh, for a couple of years, I spent some time in a, in a middle school, and we, we decided that we really needed to focus on helping students figure out what motivated them as readers and writers. And we thought that one thing that would really do that would be to introduce them to a lot of writers. And yes, it was actually true that that, that worked. So uh, one year we had, I think, 14 author visits during a school year, which was a tremendous amount of effort on the part of the, the teachers and the librarians there. But what we saw was that kids were and, and we asked them because we wanted to make sure. So we, first we wanted to know who do you want to meet? What authors are you interested in? Or what are your interests? Because it wasn't going to do any good to bring an author that we hadn't prepped the kids for or that didn't have some kind of connection to what they were already learning or working on in school. So to make a really concentrated effort on figuring out how it fits into their daily lives because it's not just necessarily that they're interested that's going to be the motivation for them to get excited about this, but it's going to be kind of what their existing background knowledge is so that they can take it and go with it. So that's really what we looked at, the, the motivation factor, but then also what it is that we're that they already have that we can build on and and it I'm hoping that it's gonna work in elementary schools too. The Pratt Library partnered with the uh, Reginald Lewis Museum and the Baltimore City Public Schools to run um, a, a bookmaking contest that um, we had funded from the Ezra Jack Keats Foundation. They run a huge one in New York and um, so we were just starting out, and uh, this gave the students a chance to write their stories, to illustrate their stories. We did a teacher workshop so the teachers learned how to um, show them different ways of making the books. Um, like anything else, we had one teacher that caught fire with the idea, and she was teaching graphic art, and we had these, all of these... Um, these um, submissions from her class, and they worked on getting um, those students to actually write and make graphic novels from what they did. And then we, we had the announcement of the winners at the Reginald Lewis Museum, and then the library displayed the winning and some of the other submissions. So the three of us, there was some kind of way that they, all three institutions were engaged. I love, I love the bookmaking. One of the other things that, that we did was we figured out that kids were so excited about what they were learning from authors that they wanted to share that with all of their classmates. So we created a podcast that students then, uh, after the author visits, would interview the authors and then develop their own podcast to share that information with other schools, other students, other communities, which was a, a lot of fun. Laura. I've been thinking a lot recently about the social dimension of reading and I, I think that that can be a really powerful draw um, to help foster that culture of reading that, that you talked about and also encourage people to read in whatever way um, who might not otherwise be doing that. Now for myself, I love nothing more than as, as an individual and private person curling up with a good book. But I'm also, I also really enjoy a book club. And I think that um, there are many examples of 
people, young and old, who are making reading social that could help it sort of catch fire. I think one example that I saw in the past year or so was a little boy, an 11-year-old boy named Sidney Keys in, in the St. Louis area who started Books and Bros. He's an African-American boy, and he was having trouble finding books about people like him. And he worked with a private bookseller, and now he has this whole African-American boys book club that's going. And I think, what, what a fabulous idea. And um, so I wonder if others have knowledge of qualitative or quantitative research on the impact of this social dimension of reading, whether it's big campaigns like Oprah Winfrey's book thing, PBS now has a, is it a book of the month or, or whatever. Um, so I, don't, I wonder if others have perspectives and information on that, because I, I think that can inject a lot of fun and social element that might be a catalyst for people to read. Okay. Um, this, this is not directly in the literacy space, but um, we've been partnering with MIT Media Lab's Peer-to-Peer -peer University and thinking a lot about how to turn MOOCs into raise the retention rates of MOOCs, it's relied, the, the really most robust um, studies on raising retention have relied on creating these peer networks. Um, and I, I think that would, that would tie closely to, to reading as well. So a lot of you know about the Harry Potter you know, kind of group of book clubs, you know, and part of their work, which is now, you know, international, and they have, you know, local chapters, so you build in the, the local social aspect as well as between chapters, and um, every year, one of the requirements, you know, um, for a chapter, and these are all free, uh, is to uh, gather books and then distribute them to, you know, um, folks in need, for it, so that's part of their deal, and they also collaborate, you know, with local uh, publishers in terms of making books available online. So that social thing really, you know, fosters, you know, uh, kind of a a growing network of of readers of literacy and friendship. I know that Chris certainly knows about this, but I just wanted to say that in classrooms where there are robust independent reading programs, you find book clubs. Uh, and you also find teachers who know books, love books, know literature, and everyday book talks. So like a movie trailer for books, advertising books all the time, catching kids' attention. Um, re, you know, we have this idea that reading is sort of a solo, lonely sort of thing, but no, in the best classrooms where readers thrive, there's a rich reading culture and lots and lots of talk and sharing. Books catch hold just like everybody wants to, you know, wear a certain brand. Every kid in the classroom wants to read the latest book from. Certainly J.K. Rowling was sort of the ultimate example. I think more kids became readers in the pages of Harry Potter than any other book in history. But reading is definitely social. It's also cultural, of course, and it's very personal. So I'm thinking this should be a project for our Literacy Awards Board of kind of to come up with uh, some best practices or do a whole symposium around making books social to, to promote that, that culture of reading. I'm, I'm very captivated with that. I, I, I think that that is a big topic that deserves more, more attention, so thanks. So we have a lot of examples of the one book, one read type of activity, especially from Nancy Pearl's encouragement. I can think of another example with teens, uh, native teens. We organized something with uh, Reader Girls a few years ago, and it was Operation Teen Book Drop. So we delivered a free book to 10,000 native teens. And feedback from the teachers involved were, and this was one of the few examples they had, they, they told us of kids who no matter where they were in reading were re rewarded. So they were used to getting, giving books to the kids who read well, but not the kids who were having difficulty. So. Just to reinforce your point, Laura, um, I was in book publishing for a number of years, and Oprah Winfrey's book club 
was the single biggest seller of books that anyone had ever seen. If you got your book nominated, named by Oprah as the book, the sales went crazy. From that, I believe, came the book clubs. All of a sudden, my cousin out on Long Island, who very rarely read, she's telling me she's going to a book club rather than going to a fitness thing. Well, it became something you were supposed to do, right? They were all reading books together. Um, and then people really began to enjoy them. I know people who make time in tremendously busy schedules to go and read the book, right? Make the time. So there's definitely, I, I agree with you, there's definitely something social and important in that that I think our board should look into. Yes. Just thinking about a culture of literacy um, and, and how we get from here to there and thinking about the scholastic statistics and thinking about Jim Trulli's handbook, read aloud handbook, and, you know, and beginning at the beginning, um, that at birth, as close as we can come to people reading aloud and having that shared experience of love and bonding around a book, the better we can be. And even though the scholastic um, statistic improved from 30 to 40 percent, that's 60 percent of people who don't know this yet. And so to think about what if every baby received a book, um, that families received a book when they're born to welcome them across our country. So just planting a seed. Um, I just wanted to follow back on um, the previous question about book clubs. So I think a lot of us are, um, we, we actually offer book club kind of programming. And one thing that we are trying to do is find more, um, more information or data to support the fact that this is really an important thing to be offering. So if there is any such data um, about this, how important it is for the social aspect of book clubs or what else they can do, um, it would be really appreciated. I think one of the things that, especially for young people, for teens in particular, is the availability of authors and their willingness to engage kids in social media. Um, most of us, if you, if you follow any of the social media, many of the authors are really, really active and they're engaging with their readers. So it's not just about um, me reading a book, it's about me interacting with, my, with the authors, the other people who like the same books that I like. So social media gets a bad rap and a well-deserved one sometimes, but it also has been a way that writers can engage with the, their readers and also to have that back and forth. And so that it does become more of a social activity. Your question I think raises uh, for, for me a few follow-ups too, which are thinking about what is, how do we, if, how do we identify the exact intervention? And then how do we, what are the indicators that we would actually evaluate for that, right? Um, is it really rising literacy rates in that community? Is it, is it economic empowerment? Is it more jobs? I think as we are, if we look at why the Gates Foundation closed their global libraries program, one of the things that they told us, um, our program officer told us was, they were framing libraries as both the solution and the problem, right? Um, what is the problem? Not enough libraries. What is the solution? Build more libraries. But more and more we're moving towards a, a place where uh, public policy priorities, foundation priorities, I think individuals too are thinking more about what are the tools and things that I invest my time in that lead me to a certain end goal, right? And I think it is our task as a community to, to communicate how our interventions around building those book clubs ties to those as well, and I, I think that that's a, I would be really interested for the researchers here to think about what is it, what, what can we do with knowing that there are so many different interventions around, around the social aspect of, of books to tie that to some of those, those priorities, those public, public, public policy priorities so that we can actually get funding for these, for these programs to continue existing, right? Guy, I think this, 
Okay, uh, is there another question? I just have a quick question. I hope it's a quick answer, but if not, it's something you might want to consider. Is there a teen online book club? There is, okay. Is there one that anyone recommends over another that we could direct teens? Because I don't feel like if there's a space we direct teens that may, they may not want to be there or they may feel regulated. Um, and that's something we've been thinking about. Can anyone answer that one? Goodreads, have you, are you familiar with that? And they have, you know, teen um, open, sp specifically geared for younger people. Are there other ones that I, that, that others know about? I think you're most often um, able to find those through the public libraries. I mean, they do, you know, specific programming. And one advantage of doing it locally is then, you know, kids that know each other face to face, then they can continue that because part of that social deal is building the relationships. But there are, I mean, like there. Teen Inc. and some of the others have been around for a long time. So I don't have it right off of the top of my head, but check with your public library and they can probably tell you what are some of the good ones or ask a teen. I have one other, one other suggestion. Um, the single biggest best selling category for book publishers right now is young adult books. And I would check individual publishers of books and they'll be listing their authors and see if there are book clubs. I don't know any off the top of my head, but my guess is that there very well might be book clubs within those websites, because they've gotten much more active in those areas. I there, that's it. Oh, I'll add one thing to that. There's a new initiative through the American Library Association with a Kellogg grant on truth, racial equity, and transformation. And these are to set up national discussions around those topics with teens across the U.S., with, starting with some pilot public libraries. So they have their material available as well. Well, thanks to everyone for really stellar panels. I mean, really. <laughs> Not just blah, 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 but concrete stuff. <laughs> This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.